Okay, so uh, screen is uh, shared. Uh, and uh, should I start? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so um, yes. Uh, hi to everybody. And uh, uh, um, <clears throat> nice to be back uh, after uh, uh, this uh, very interesting day yesterday. And uh, yeah, yesterday um, I was talking mainly about neutron stars as compact objects, and I decided that I would uh, just to uh, go into the black holes uh, immediately today because what uh, I did not yet discuss yesterday about neutron stars was more or less uh, just more examples uh, showing how we would uh, learn in different theories uh, about uh, properties of neutron stars and then um, uh, try to extract something about uh, uh, generalized theories of gravity. So today, for the black holes, I will do it just uh, the very same way. I'll start with uh, GR and then I will go beyond GR. So here um, we have uh, one very interesting possibility how we can test uh, GR. And so uh, what we see is uh, uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy uh, imaged. <laughs> uh, let's say by an artist, and uh, then we uh, have the orbit of one of the um, uh, uh, one of the bright stars around it, uh, the S2 orbit, and this uh, was uh, uh, now mapped for a long time. So one could uh, determine um, the, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say perihelial shift because uh, there is no hail, no, no sun at the center. But uh, yeah, the, the shift uh, with respect uh, uh, to this uh, compact object uh, at the center. And uh, this uh, very well fits within our general relativity uh, theory. But of course, uh, uh, in order to obtain limits from that, we would need much, much more precise measurements. And the other uh, very uh, nice thing that we saw and that was the shadow that we saw last year. And this is the shadow of the supermassive uh, black hole in M87. And uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration has uh, brought us this beautiful picture. Uh, so uh, we see this dark part here. Uh, so we can measure the shadow really. And this is something we can compare with uh, also with some theories of gravity and possibly learn something. And uh, if we know more about uh, this uh, black hole, like it's been, uh, we might uh, put just from such uh, a nice uh, image uh, also limits on, on uh, such theories. And of course, uh, we have um, um, lots and lots of things we have already learned and will learn in the future from uh, gravitation waves. Uh, and here we don't yet have so much uh, models for the gravitation waves from other theories of gravity. So, so most things we know as from uh, the GR part, but people are um, really starting to work on that. And I just saw um, there's a paper on the archive today uh, working uh, in this direction, doing the numerical relativity calculations. Uh, um, <clears throat> so the, the full-fledged uh, calculations and one of the theories we're going to discuss. So now coming to uh, GR, of course, uh, all of us, uh, we know the curve black hole. And uh, the, the big question is, does the curve paradigm hold? So are these objects that we see, uh, are these really curved black holes? Um, are they black holes of some alternative theory of gravity? Or are they something else? Um, and this is what we would like uh, to understand. Now, the black holes in general relativity, um, which we now know since uh, 63, 
they are very, very simple objects. Um, of course, when you look at the current metric, it was very uh, uh, difficult to, to, to find uh, uh, the solution because of the rotation less symmetry. But uh, once we have it and we study it, we see a um, very, very simple, such a black hole, a rotating black hole, because it's hairless, <laughs> as we say. So uh, we, we don't see uh, much anymore of what uh, went in, um, but uh, we just see two quantities, right? We see the mass and we see uh, the angular momentum. And uh, again, I don't discuss uh, electric charge or magnetic charge. So um, uh, I, I, I will just look at some uncharged object because we think from an astrophysical point of view, the charge is not will be very, very small, so it won't be uh, that big an effect uh, anyway. And so we have um, our black hole, our rotating black hole, characterized by just two quantities, mass and angular momentum. And they really determine everything. So when we look at the space-time, and uh, yesterday we looked at three hair or four hair relations for neutron stars, here we have just uh, the two hair relations. So it's uh, the no hair theorem, right? And we can express all the uh, multiple moments uh, um, in terms of these two quantities, um, which makes this a very, very simple um, object to, to study. And uh, here, um, this is from our colleagues uh, in Bremen. Um, uh, from uh, uh, Arne and Klaus Volker. Um, they have studied uh, now the shadow of such a black hole in general relativity. Of course, they have also allowed for more parameters. They have looked at a nut chart, which one could allow for. Uh, they have allowed for a cosmologic constant and uh, uh, the innermost, uh, the, the lightest blue. This is uh, the shadow of a pure curved black hole. And here we see this A is our parameter again, uh, the specific uh, angular momentum, so angular momentum divided by mass. And uh, here we uh, yeah, have the corresponding numbers and we see how it changes as the angular momentum uh, of the black hole changes. So from no angular momentum, looking at it uh, under 90 degrees, right? So that we really see the deformation. If we would uh, look uh, along the axis, we wouldn't see anything. Of course, it would be round. But uh, from this angle, uh, we, we have the most deformation possible. And uh, yeah, it's beautifully illustrated uh, in their papers. And we know in general relativity lots and lots about the in spiral and the merger and the ring down. For the Kirk case, uh, we do have uh, also the quasi-normal modes uh, studied since a long time. And uh, it's, it's basically uh, here in the in spiral, we can uh, obtain things in an analytic way uh, in terms of some expansion. Then here we can do the quasi-normal modes. And in this part, we have to do really the, the full numerical relativity. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, <clears throat> this is hard to do then in particular when one goes to generalized theories of gravity. They may present uh, uh, problems um, to uh, really study them, which are being tackled uh, currently by several groups. Now, this is what we have uh, in GR, ordinary GR. And I should say, uh, we uh, have just uh, added the, the particles of the standard model. But we can stay in GR. Yes, so we stay in GR. However, we add some other particles. So um, this is possible, right? We have some ideas. We might uh, want to have additional matter, dark matter um, forming 
whatever objects uh, in uh, space time. So let's just add uh, either a complex scalar, and it's important, it's complex, or let's add a complex vector. And uh, both of them should be massive. So we have some additional uh, complex field. Now for the scalar, I must say I'm really happy adding a scalar for the vector with a mass. Um, then looking at the standard model, um, but now we introduce the Higgs boson, uh, just to have renormalizability. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, it, it might be uh, a bit hard to swallow, but let's do that. So let's uh, just add some tentative additional light field. And then in general relativity, we get already uh, much more and uh, kind of interesting stuff, I would say. Um, you uh, all know about boson stars. Uh, they have been with us for a very long time. And what you see here, the red line, this would be the simplest type of boson stars obtained with a, a scalar field, a complex scalar field. And we see the mass. Uh, and here we see the frequency of the boson field. Because when we uh, have a scalar field that is complex, we can uh, give it such uh, a, a periodic time dependence with an omega. So this is the frequency of the scalar field. And uh, yeah, in, in such a case, uh, we, uh, we will have the possibility to evade the very well studied uh, no hair theorem of uh, general relativity because we do have a time dependence. It's, it's this factor, this time dependent factor uh, which gives us uh, this possibility, but uh, I mean, having the boson stars for such a long time around, um, it came very late. It's only a few years back that uh, Carlos Sedillo and Eugene Rado, they finally realized uh, there would be hairy black holes associated uh, with these boson stars. So one can put a horizon somewhere into this uh, boson star, but one has to impose a very special condition. And uh, here what you see is then, uh, we, I should really uh, say it's important that the boson star is rotating, because otherwise uh, uh, only the time dependence doesn't help. We, uh, so we have a time dependent a rotating boson star, and then um, we can put the phi dependence up here, just uh, with some constant m, which has to be an integer. Uh, so um, yeah, everything is well defined uh, in our space time. And uh, then for the, such an onset for this field uh, and imposing at the horizon uh, this condition that is uh, being called uh, horizon synchronization condition, that the frequency omega is just precisely equal to that uh, integer m times the horizon angular velocity of the black hole, then one does get uh, black holes, hairy black holes uh, or curved black holes with uh, scalar hair as they have been uh, termed often. So the red curve, this is the boson star and anything in here corresponds to uh, some hairy black hole. And uh, the green dotted line, this corresponds to extremal hairy black holes. And down here, we uh, range into um, uh, the domain of existence uh, of uh, the curved black holes, and you see there's some overlap here. And uh, this dotted line, this is just for the curved black holes. Um, they will have a C mode. 
So right here, we have a zero mode, which means beyond that zero mode, uh, we can have uh, hairy black holes. So that was, I would say, was a really big surprise um, to uh, most of the community that uh, uh, such uh, objects would uh, be there, at least in theory. And uh, yeah, it's just general relativity with a complex scalar field that has mass, because without a mass, uh, um, we, uh, yeah, we would not uh, be able to have these uh, solutions. These uh, solutions, so you see here, the frequency is scaled by mu mass times uh, this m, uh, which uh, for the simplest case just corresponds to one so it's the simplest type of uh, rotating boson star and the associated black holes. And this uh, M, this also is in the relation between the scalar charge and the angular momentum. So they have just as a proportionality factor, this M. And as we increase M, we obtain a faster rotating um, objects which have higher spin. But uh, yeah, we, we to retain these uh, heavily codes for whatever M we choose. Now, would these be possible candidates uh, for the black holes that we have in the universe? Um, let's look at some of their properties. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, drawing, I think, from one of their papers. They have very many uh, on these. Uh, where we, is, we just look at uh, the ergosphere, or here we shouldn't say sphere anymore. For a uh, curve, we are used to saying ergosphere. But here, let's just say ergosurface. And uh, actually, a boson star can have some uh, ergo surface. But uh, it has to be normally uh, behind the maximum. So it would be in the unstable region of the boson star. Um, and uh, then the, the argosphere, the boundary, is just a torus. So um, uh, <clears throat> such a boson star would have an ergotorus. But now imagine what happens uh, when we don't have a star, but we have uh, this uh, black hole that has hair, bosonic hair. And then we have uh, two types of uh, ergo. Uh, regions, uh, or surfaces. This here, um, in this area, it looks, I would say, pretty normal. Um, but when you would go into this area, we would have uh, uh, disconnected pieces. So down here, uh, this would be ordinary, but there would be an Argotaurus uh, around it. So it's like an Ergo Saturn. Um, that uh, is arising here. And uh, then one can look at uh, the shadow, of course. Uh, the shadow is quite observed. So let's uh, have a look at the shadow of these objects. And uh, here for comparison, uh, this is uh, a curved black hole, a shadow. Uh, for um, yeah, these parameters. Uh, and uh, now let's take the same mass and the same angular momentum and look at the corresponding hairy black hole. And then you see the shadow is uh, quite different, right? So it's uh, smaller because uh, there's quite a bit of mass outside. So the horizon mass uh, is uh, smaller than the total mass. And it's also more quadratic. It looks more quadratic. So uh, this might uh, possibly be discerned depending on rotation. And uh, when one looks at um, some pictures of um, um, shadows uh, in nature, one might uh, compare and possibly say something. But um, these hairy black holes, they can violate the curve bound. And when they violate the curve bound, um, and when it looks at their shadows, they can have very fantastic shapes. Um, this is uh, then one such uh, example. And uh, yeah, 
Uh, if we would see something like that, we would immediately know, no, this is not a Kerr black hole, right? So it, it has a completely different shape here, uh, these ears, and then, <laughs> I don't know, um, these things up here, they are called eyebrows uh, often. Um, and depending on, on the parameters, really, uh, also these ears here, they fall off the central part. So something like this, we would immediately uh, be able to discern. And this is not what we saw in M87. Um, just to, to be complete, um, we can do also a POCA stars. Um, this is again from Hedia uh, Wanradu. But POCA stars, so when they are rotating, um, they um, are a bit more complicated and uh, uh, otherwise, um, yeah, the, the same thing um, is happening here. We have a synchronization condition that has to be satisfied at the horizon in order to have this uh, polka hair. Uh, and uh, here we have um, the polka stars in red and inside uh, we have the hairy black holes. And this is just for comparison once more the scalar field uh, boson stars and the hairy black holes. So um, in general relativity, if we allow for additional fields, then we may uh, already have some completely different uh, uh, properties of uh, these hairy black holes from what we have uh, for the curved black holes. But now let's... Uh, go beyond GR. Let's look what uh, we might get uh, when we are beyond GR. And uh, the first thing I discussed yesterday, that were scalar tensor theory uh, neutron stars. And uh, of course, um, scalar tensor theories are nice theories. And we saw for the neutron stars, there was this uh, interesting effect of matter-induced uh, spontaneous scalarization. And uh, so the question is, do we have this also here? When you just take a simple scalar tensor theory, not uh, Hondeski, just simple. Um, and uh, then I must say, no, in principle, not. How did we get the scalarization? Because in our scalar field equation, we had a source term. And the source term, I've just uh, taken it from yesterday's uh, talk, this contains uh, the energy momentum tensor. But when you have a, a Kerr uh, black hole, there, there is no such matter in addition. No, no, no matter, like the neutron star matter that could act as a source term. So for Kerr, only Kerr, it doesn't work. However, if we take uh, those hairy black holes uh, of Edero uh, and uh, Radu, then of course we do have matter. Now we, we, have, uh, we can just take a boson star. And the boson star is matter. No, it's hypothetical matter, but it's uh, matter which uh, we can take here. So we can just do the very same stuff uh, as uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, then what we see is yes, indeed, we do get scalarization of uh, these uh, boson stars. Now, these curves look a bit different from what I showed you. The reason is only. Um, that the, the curves of uh, Hedera and Radu, they were only with the mass term of the boson field. But uh, here, uh, a self-interaction has been added. So um, the green curve now is just the boson star without um, scalarization. And up here, this boundary, uh, this then corresponds uh, to the scalarized uh, set of solutions and uh, the yellow in here, these would be the hairy uh, black holes uh, without scalarization, but the green ones up here, they would be scalarized. So one can do it. The question is uh, whether one wants to do that. 
it might be somewhat uh, contrived to have a gravitational scalar field and in addition, a complex uh, scalar field, but it's possible. But for these simple scalar tensor theories, uh, we have no other possibility. So nothing else for matter induced uh, spontaneous scalarization. Of course, we can take a, a polka field. So uh, therefore, I would like to uh, continue with uh, those theories, which now I didn't uh, discuss the neutron stars anymore, uh, really, namely the quadratic gravity theories. And uh, here, we uh, look at the higher curvature corrections, which are quadratic. And uh, in particular, uh, we would have uh, here the R star R term, for the, which is uh, the transimens uh, scalar, or the Gauss-Bonnet scalar. And most is known about the Gauss-Bonnet scalar. And this is uh, where I will dwell on now. Um, this is a particular type of Mondeski theory, the gauss bonnet scalar. We do get uh, second order field equations, which is nice. And uh, for a gauss bonnet theory, when we take a dilaton, we have very nice uh, motivation. So we have a beautiful motivation from string theory because uh, yeah, in the low energy uh, effective action, this is why it appears. So uh, we do have a dilaton and a gauss bonnet term. So um, I would say it's, it's nicely motivated. Of course, it's a Hondeski and it's even a FAT4. But I tried to uh, motivate you yesterday that for compact objects, um, this is uh, still very interesting. And many people are working on these theories. Uh, in connection with compact objects, yes, for cosmology, things are different. And uh, yeah, also Tessa, <laughs> she had uh, um, this uh, fact for in her, her red part. But uh, they are very well motivated, I would say. And uh, yes, so um, try to solve cosmology, uh, late time cosmology, dark energy in a different way. Uh, so that we can um, uh, keep these nice theories. So this is uh, the first I would like to discuss, um, the uh, dilatonic uh, scalar field, uh, as we obtain it from string theory. And uh, so here we have the gauss bonnet term, and it's coupled with a coupling function. And uh, for the dilaton, we have this exponential coupling function, but in the exponential, the scalar field is just linear. So we just have an e to the minus some coupling constant phi, and we have another coupling constant in front. In string theory, gamma should be one. Um, of course, in principle, one can play with that. And uh, the, as I said, the nice thing is um, these uh, models, uh, they lead to second or the equations uh, of motion. And uh, so they are quite reasonably uh, be well behaved. And uh, uh, because of that, also uh, um, quite uh, uh, reasonably well to study. So having this uh, gauss bonnet term, this then has immediately the consequence uh, that we do have a scalar hair. And the scalar hair this is a dilaton pair. However, um, uh, we also have some bounds uh, on our couplings. Uh, and uh, there are various uh, coupling, uh, bounds on the coupling from observations. Uh, I'll discuss uh, some more later. But uh, there's some bound also from theory. Um, and of course, one has to uh, combine, combine this uh, theory bound uh, with observations. And uh, I'll discuss this um, now uh, soon. Next, why do we also have a bound uh, on this alpha parameter on our coupling constant uh, uh, from theory? Mm -hmm. It's a bit uh, unusual sometimes. 
But uh, first I'd like to show you the set of equations. Of course, we have uh, our set of equations, uh, the Einstein equations and the scalar equation. And in the Einstein equation, um, we have uh, <clears throat> here the, the, the ordinary part from the uh, dilaton, but then we have also, this is how it's written, an effective contribution to this energy momentum tensor just from the gravitational part from the Gauss connector. And uh, this is that allows for everything in particular that allows for this uh, scalar here. So this is how we uh, then yeah, uh, obtain our violation of uh, the no hair theorem. This is uh, giving us the entrance there. And most important for our discussion is the scalar equation now in the following. And we can write it in this way. Uh, here we have again um, the um, Dallam version. And uh, then we have the coupling function, which uh, yeah, is this coupling function here. Uh, then we have this coupling function, uh, which we take the derivative with respect to phi and the gauss bonnet term. And uh, because the way we have uh, chosen this coupling function, because of this way, we do not obtain uh, the ordinary GR black holes. So the Schwarzschild black hole or the Kerr black hole, they are not solutions uh, of uh, our system of equations. And this makes, um, these uh, solutions, therefore, special and different from the next type of discuss. So here, there are no GR black holes. We do have uh, scalarization. We do have a scalar field. But uh, um, our ordinary curve and Schwarzschild black holes, they are not solutions of the uh, equations of motion. So let's uh, look, uh, and these solutions, um, this the static solutions in particular have been obtained long ago because it was very interesting for the motivation from string theory. And uh, here what we see is um, uh, the horizon radius um, scaled by uh, the coupling constant alpha. Um, and here we have the mass scaled by the coupling constant alpha. And for comparison, you see the dotted Schwarzschild black hole, and you see the solid hairy black hole. And here comes the surprise that was found at the time. Namely, they stop. This curve stops. Um, this means for a given value of alpha of the coupling constant, uh, we cannot uh, have arbitrarily uh, small uh, black holes. So we have a bound on the size or a bound uh, on the mass. And uh, this arises because, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a physical reason really uh, to explain. Um, it arises from the expansion. If one looks at the horizon expansion, then one finds for the, uh, in the expansion such a coefficient for the scalar field. And you see, we have a square root. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite possible, depending here on alpha prime and Rh, that uh, we obtain zero. And this is it. Because if we go beyond, oh, we would uh, have an imaginary number. And this is not what we want. We want a real scalar field. We don't want a complex scalar field. So we, we just stop. Uh, and uh, this is some critical solution. Uh, and it's obtained because of um, that square root that arises. And this will be always uh, basically the same. For a more complicated uh, solutions like the rotating solutions or other coupling functions, it's always something like that. Um, in the expansion that we see, we cannot go beyond because some radicant uh, 
uh, would uh, become complex. So these were the, um, the static ones. Of course, one can also then rotate them. Um, maybe I should uh, add a comment. We see as we go to uh, here, small masses uh, or small radii, horizon radii, that um, the deviation between Schwarzschild and hairy black holes increases. Yeah? So up here, for large mass, large radii, yeah, we have a very little difference, but as we go yeah, towards our limit, towards the critical solution, the deviation uh, increases and becomes maximal. And this is so now a figure for the rotating solutions, and this is the scaled area um, versus uh, the scaled angular momentum. And here, this line on uh, the, the left side, this just corresponds uh, now to those static black holes that we have looked at, and we see right here um, the domain of existence is really the biggest. As we move uh, to faster rotation, then we see the domain of existence uh, decreases and it decreases. And uh, yeah, right here, this dark black line, this is the curved solution, the curve limit. And these uh, dots, they correspond to critical solutions, uh, which are just some radicant will vanish and we would have a complex scalar field to beyond. And then you see you can cross the curve bound here, just a tiny bit, but we can violate it uh, slightly and go beyond the curve bound uh, with uh, these black holes. Of course, it's such a tiny violation um, this would uh, probably not be discernible uh, from any observations. Um, it, it's just too small. Uh, what would be bigger effects for such uh, black holes? Um, yeah, th this would be ISCOs, for instance. For the ISCOs, uh, one does get uh, effects uh, that are quite a bit uh, bigger, for instance. But now, how about uh, our um, two hairs? Uh, we have the mass, we have the angular momentum, and now for Kerr, we can express uh, the quadrupole moment uh, just in terms uh, of the mass and the angular momentum, right? Uh, but if we take this very same quantity and we scale the uh, uh, quadrupole moment so that the Kerr value will then just be one, uh -huh, which we can do, then we see it's no longer the case uh, for these uh, hairy dilatonic black holes because now we can have much uh, larger quadrupole moments. And um, yeah, similar things will happen for hair moments. How about the shadow? Now, the shadow, I must say, the shadow is somewhat uh, disappointing. Yes, here you see the shadow, but uh, yeah. It's a few percent. So from the shadow, we would never be able to see anything. However, when we look at uh, gravitational waves, quasi normal modes, it's much more interesting. So here we see this is now done only so far, really only for the static solutions. The rotating solutions are still a challenge, but they will be tackled certainly um, because they are most important. But this is uh, quite an all mode uh, for just uh, the static solutions. And what you see here is now uh, um, the frequency and the imaginary part uh, of uh, the eigenvalue. So uh, they are scaled with respect to the Schwarzschild values. And uh, down here, you have uh, the coupling constant, the scale coupling constant. And as we increase the coupling constant, we see, yes, we uh, obtain deviations, but 
the really big deviations we obtain only uh, for these extra modes, um, uh, ordinary L equal to two modes, so when you're very close to our theoretical limit. Um, and maybe uh, uh, this is uh, too high. Uh, maybe observations will uh, kill this before. How about the polar modes? Now for the polar modes, uh, there's already something interesting. Namely, we now have two types of polar modes. Uh, scalar field is present. So the scalar field uh, is going to give a new type of uh, polar mode, L equal to two, ordinary L equal to two polar modes, so quadruple mode. And um, in addition, of course, we have the, the old um, quadruple modes, the gravitational led um, polar modes, as we call them. And they are quite different. Yes, uh, so we have the gravitation led uh, polar modes and we have the scalar led polar modes. So we see we, we have a second type of uh, polar quadrupole um, excitation that could be there. Um, but this is not all. Um, there's also monopole radiation possible in principle, and uh, we would have dipole modes, all because of this scalar field. And uh, yeah, one might be able uh, to see them and then, of course, also constrain them. And uh, this is then from a paper earlier this year. Um, here, all the knowledge, uh, all that has been calculated uh, so far has been taken together to obtain bounds uh, on this parameter alpha. And I should have said, don't look really at the precise numbers because uh, alpha is normalized differently in lots of papers. So one has all kinds of normalizations here. But we can recalculate them. Uh, and uh, yeah, you see there's bounds uh, then also from yeah, these uh, gravitational wave observations have been included. Uh, there's bounds uh, from the inspire, from the axial, from the polar, and from the combination. So when one does get some limits already, and uh, yeah, uh, this will of course improve, but certainly one will have to have and to obtain also the uh, gravitation waves uh, for the rotating black hole cases. Now, um, for the dilatonic black holes, we never had uh, curve solutions or never had Schwarzschild solutions. However, only recently, three years ago, it was realized there could be also spontaneous scalarization, not this induced scalarization as we discussed now, but spontaneous scalarization. Um, if one were to uh, yeah, take a different coupling function. So if we take f of phi, let's say to be quadratic in phi and not just uh, yeah, linear in the exponential, we could write down exponential, but we could also just uh, uh, write down some phi squared. Uh, um, in such a case, uh, in our equations, we would see that yes, phi equal to zero and uh, d phi, uh, the f by d phi uh, equal to zero as possible. And then, so when this vanishes, uh, we, we don't have, um, uh, we also have uh, a vanishing scalar field as a solution. So having certain conditions satisfied uh, by this coupling function, when can have uh, and can retain the GR solutions. However, one can also obtain hairy, scalar, with scalar hair, hairy uh, black hole solutions um, if yeah, one obtains scalarization because of some, you know, something must induce uh, the scalarization. We, we must have here this term uh, and the Gauss-Bonnet term, this is such a term, but it's a curvature term. 
is such a term that can induce then the scalarization, just similar as we did it uh, before by a um, tachyonic uh, instability. So we, you know, we, we have our mass term again, remember? Uh, and uh, we have the gauss bonnet term and we can combine that and the for when you let's, when you just look at the static at the Schwarzschild solution here we have um, a simple function right and it's a positive function and if we put this here and uh, take some simple coupling then we see yes we do get a negative effect of mass so uh, we have a tachyonic instability and then uh, it, it's very simple and clean here in this uh, um, black hole case because yeah, we don't have the complications through the, due to the neutron matter, but our curvature term is so nice for Schwarzschild um, that we, we can just see it, that there will be some negative mode, first some zero mode and then some negative mode. So there will be definitely some scalarization. Uh, we look at the scalar perturbation equation. Now we do the usual stuff, uh, put in our perturbation for the scalar field, obtain a Schrodinger-like equation with potential. And now this potential has here from our tachyonic mass a negative piece. And uh, this can be a bound state. And we can just simply uh, uh, on a sheet of paper, <laughs> on an envelope, as one says, uh, do some estimate, uh, perform the integral of uh, that uh, function, yeah, the, the potential over space, uh, and see, yeah, uh, we get something negative and uh, we obtain a bound. So uh, we see Schwarzschild becomes unstable. Uh, <laughs> we have curvature-induced uh, uh, scalarization. And this is what uh, several groups uh, found at the same time. Here, um, I've, I've taken it from uh, Donova and collaborators. And um, this is the dilatonic charge, always scaled with a coupling constant. Uh, here we have the mass scaled with a coupling constant. And of course, uh, Schwarzschild uh, doesn't have a dilatonic uh, charge, so we just have the zero line, this is Schwarzschild. But as soon as we have scalarization, we do have uh, here this uh, scalar uh, black hole. And for this uh, coupling function, and this makes it such a nice coupling function, this excited, you know, this hairy uh, black hole this, uh, where the scalar field is excited, is present. Um, this is then the stable solution, and um, it doesn't have any unstable modes. So, of course, the scalar field uh, can also have some radial excitations. So, one can look at these radial excitations, which is uh, also something interesting to study. But I think I will not uh, dwell on this uh, at the moment. Uh, but just demonstrate uh, when we look at um, um, the, the entropy, the entropy uh, will be higher for um, this uh, scalarized black hole. So it's the preferred solution and Schwarzschild is unstable. I can do um, yeah, very nice uh, mode analysis with all of that. Um, um, but all the other modes, uh, they are unstable. However, this first scalarized uh, mode, this, uh, when we're studying all the perturbations that are possible, this uh, does not have a negative mode. So there we really have a stable solution within a certain range of the coupling. What else? Uh, now I, I said um, it's a very nice solution or very nice coupling constant because we have uh, these stable solutions that are scaled. If we would just take a phi squared coupling, then um, 
yeah, we do have the scalarized, uh, the, the, the heavy black holes, they are unstable. One can stabilize them if one allows for a mass term. And uh, this is here demonstrated uh, when it has a mass, uh, and one can also uh, uh, include some self interaction. And uh, one sees uh, a small mass, but a large self interaction is very favorable to have uh, a larger set of uh, such objects. Now, um, when we'd like to uh, study what is happening for the rotating black hole, is this also interesting? Uh, this has um, been uh, done by uh, Kunya and collaborators. So here, um, the Gauss-Bonnet term has to be considered with respect to Kerr. And so uh, when we look at Kerr, we do have, uh, in addition, this uh, chi, which is A times cos theta. So this is what is entering here, and we see there are some terms with minus signs. We, we still do have uh, certainly a negative uh, effective mass, so we do have uh, a scalarization, but we can imagine from these minus signs, uh, which give us terms which increase with rotation, that rotation is going to suppress uh, scalarization. And this is really borne out by obtaining the, the full set of uh, solutions. One can see here we have uh, the scaled angular momentum versus the scaled mass. If we uh, down here, so this is uh, the set of uh, static black holes just on the line. Yeah, and uh, here it's, it's a huge set. It's coming all the way from zero up to here uh, to the existence line. But as we go up in angular momentum, we see uh, our domain of existence gets smaller. And uh, it's again shown here so that we see already um, um, the area of the horizon uh, now versus uh, the angular momentum. Uh, in the static case, we have a huge possibility, but uh, as we increase rotation, we come closer and closer to curve. Now, why is this important? We can look at the shadow, and this is uh, what they did. They looked at the shadow and uh, tried to see whether they would find some upper bound uh, for the shadow, uh, from the shadow for uh, the theory. Now. If uh, we would know what the, really the spin of this uh, black hole in uh, M87 were, we might uh, already say something. At the moment, uh, we cannot because, um, yeah, as you have seen, for um, the spin, when the spin is uh, very big, we come just uh, towards the Kerr case. So the, the deviations become rather small. But if this uh, black hole in M87 would be spinning rather slowly, then we could have a shadow that is much, much smaller than the corresponding shadow. And we would be able to uh, constrain the theory that the parameter lambda, the coupling constant here, just from uh, observing this shadow. Jutta, you have 10 minutes left. Yes, thank you. So okay. this is uh, very interesting, I would say, um, that uh, we would have such, an, such a handle here from the shadow on this uh, type of theory. Um, uh, yeah, one can, of course, look at different coupling constants uh, and uh, different coupling functions, I mean. And uh, this was the one that was giving the, the stable uh, static black holes and probably therefore also the stable rotating black holes. This is now putting just the simplest uh, case, uh, simplest coupling function uh, with a phi square into rotation. And uh, yeah, here there's no uh, stability when you look at uh, the entropy. This is uh, smaller. Um, than for the curved black hole, but I mean, 
this is also expected, right? Um, the static case is uh, unstable. So also the rotating case is expected to carry this along at least for some time, but here there's uh, no, no change uh, visible. Um, the most recent uh, interesting observations uh, on this uh, scalarization, on these uh, gauss bonnet theories uh, um, was made by Dima and collaborators. Namely, they were looking again at um, the gauss bonnet term with these yeah, minus signs, plus signs and minus signs. And we have seen, yeah, of course, uh, um, we do keep uh, the scalarization. However, for a uh, large coupling, for large rotation, um, for large rotation, we had this quenching. Yeah? So um, the domain of existence uh, was really shrinking. But uh, we do have um, we, we do have the case of uh, spontaneous uh, curvature induced scalarization. But now having these minus signs, um, they were kind of thinking, wouldn't it, it be possible that uh, we also have a scalarization uh, just uh, when we reverse the sign of this whole thing? So when we take a coupling constant with a different sign. But so far, we always looked at the plus to get this effective mass, but no. Uh, because of rotation, it could be possible that we can also scalarize if uh, we have sufficiently fast rotation. And this is indeed what is happening. And this has been then termed to a spin induced, but it's still the curvature term. So, but uh, yeah, it's just called spin induced uh, uh, spontaneous scalarization. And here, this is the, uh, the very interesting paper uh, by Dima. They were looking at where is the onset. So where is the onset? Here we have uh, uh, the uh, spin parameter A by M. And here we have the coupling constant. And the onset then is uh, this green fat line. So right here, uh, when we uh, have yeah, sufficient uh, fast rotation. So when the angular momentum is sufficiently big, then this uh, gauss bonnet term, then this can induce uh, scalarization. So this line here, this gives us the zero mode. Yeah, And uh, what they have done actually is they, they have uh, solved the scalar field equation numerically um, just just the linear equation. And uh, this then gives the onset, it gives the zero mode. And uh, it also gives um, then, um, let's say the decay time of uh, uh, these uh, modes. Question is, uh, oh yeah, I should say uh, the onset really happens for fast rotation. So the onset happens when J, so it's uh, angular momentum by mass squared, is bigger than 0.5 or 0.5, 0.5. This is just um, the boundary. And um, yeah, Donova and colleagues, uh, they have uh, also looked at the mass dependence. They've given the, the scalar field of some mass, and you see have some change. Uh, uh, but uh, the effect uh, basically remains. But what one would like to have is the, the real, the full-fledged solutions, right? The full-fledged solutions. And these, uh, you know, one has to integrate numerically. This is again by um, uh, Hedero and collaborators. Um, looking at uh, now the domain of existence of these uh, spin induced Terry black holes. And uh, here we have the uh, area versus the angular momentum. 
And we see it's quite interesting. So now we can, for this coupling function, go quite a bit beyond the curve bound. So here, this is uh, our uh, domain that is of most interest, I would say. And um, yeah, so far, uh, one has not yet uh, or looked at um, for the consequences of uh, this, so like the shadow. But yeah, this um, might be uh, not, or for the uh, observers, might be looked at uh, uh, in, the, in the future. One can also have an odd scalar field here, parity odd, and then one obtains uh, basically a very similar phenomenon. So the last uh, example I have, uh, this is Trent-Simons gravity. This actually does give a, a very, uh, very pronounced uh, signature in the case of neutron stars uh, in uh, these universal relations. Here, um, yes, uh, it's a parity violating theory. We have uh, just uh, higher we have higher order equations of, uh, of motion now. It's therefore much harder to study. Uh, but we also have uh, not such uh, good bounds. And some first studies uh, have been performed. But uh, as I said, because of numerics, uh, it, it's very hard to obtain the full set. Uh, perturbation theory does give some insight. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would say for, for this type of theory, there's a lot uh, to be done yet. So let me uh, conclude. I hope I hope um, I have uh, given you some interesting examples uh, today on black holes and yesterday on neutron stars. How we might uh, be able to discern um, these um, yeah, generalized models of gravity, or at least put bounds on them. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, there are other compact objects around. Uh, uh, I did touch upon boson stars, but there are so many other objects uh, like uh, wormholes, uh, uh, particle-like solutions, um, um, singularities, uh, which uh, yeah, one might also want to explore. And uh, yeah. So we'll see, we'll see uh, how far general relativity is going to survive uh, with our future uh, observations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuta, for your interesting lecture. So we have time for a couple of questions or comments. There is one in the chat, Elias. Okay, it's one question uh, from Victor Manuel. Do you want to ask direct directly, Victor? Are you there? Okay, yes. So it's, it's about the black holes, black hole solutions uh, that you have found in Young Mills with a Young Mills uh, field. Um, my question is: Are there any studies on their shadows? Uh, with the young Mills fields, um, I <laughs> I could have touched upon them also. Um, yes, so uh, when I was uh, uh, talking about, um, I mean, thank you very much for the question. I should say, when I was uh, talking about um, uh, standard model and going beyond the standard model, of course. Uh, when we uh, obtained uh, the these, uh, we uh, we were just using standard model fields. So in the standard model, you, you can obtain them. However, they have unstable modes if you do it in the standard model. Um, and uh, so, from these unstable modes, uh, you would not think they are of. Uh, as a physical relevance. Also, when you, you take ordinary values huh, for, for the masses and the coupling constants from the standard model, um, then, uh, yeah, again, you would uh, say, 
this is microscopic physics uh, and these are microscopic uh, black holes and they are microscopic unstable black holes. So we're not going to learn um, uh, about them from the shadow, but the, they are there and they are within the standard model. Uh, um, I don't know whether anybody has looked at that. I, um, I would expect no one has looked at the rotating ones uh, because they are much more involved to, to study and to uh, yeah, solve them. But we have all these uh, solutions sitting around from years back. So if anybody would feel like uh, looking at them, we'll be happy to share the solutions and uh, yeah, we'll see whether um, yeah, uh, this can be applied to, to astrophysics. So this is a different question, but from a just pure theoretical point of view, it might be quite nice, quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Chen Yu, can you ask directly? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so uh, at the very beginning of your today's slides, you show uh, the shadows of curved echo and compare the shadow with a particular uh, objects with scalar hair. And it seems that the size is, if you, if you choose the same mass, then the size of the shadow is comparable small, smaller than the curved one. And I'm wondering uh, if this is true, then uh, according to what we have seen from the uh, M87 star, uh, the, 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 inf the, the mass that we inferred uh, from the shadow size of M87 star is quite consistent with that we obtained from the, for example, stellar dynamics. So can we say, yeah, this picture. So can we say that this particular model has been ruled out by this uh, apparent size of the shadow that we have seen from MD7 star? Um, no, I, I would not go that far um, because um, we do have, um, we don't have the, the angular momentum of uh, M87. So, um, as long as we are um, more spherical, um, it might be that we are reasonably close. I, I don't yet have the, the full uh, set of, uh, I don't have the full parameter space uh, for this uh, type of uh, objects, uh, but I, I would say it's, it's still quite big. So we might, find some shadow that might still fit. Um, but it's a, a very interesting question. I will ask uh, Eugen and uh, Carlos uh, uh, about it, whether they have really scanned uh, that far that they could make a comparison and possibly exclude something from here. But uh, I think it, it will be very important that we find a get a measurement of the, the spin of M87. Because as long as we say it can be very small or very large, um, yeah, um, there's just so much radiation in the shadows uh, also from these uh, hairy black holes um, that, that it's hard. But as soon as we have the momentum, I think uh, we'll have a very strong handle uh, on these shadows. Okay, I think the, 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 the point is that usually for black hole solution, uh, the, the, the spin doesn't change too much the size of the parent shadow. That's, that's, the, usually, that's the usual case, but I, I'm not sure whether in this particular model, uh, changing spin would, uh, would, would affect the size significantly. I'm not sure, but usually um, it doesn't. Yeah, just as, uh, I mean, in, in this uh, example here, um, uh, we have uh, the possibility of, we have a huge variation, right? So when you have small spin, the size uh, of the um, horizon can be very, very different as you see. And uh, there's some smaller spin here 
So we, we do have a, a big effect. So for these uh, alternative theories, uh, we can have huge effect on the size of the shadow. Then, so uh, this is why I think I should be cautious uh, also about uh, uh, making a statement uh, in this case here, um, because I, I haven't seen the full uh, um, set of solutions. But uh, I will certainly ask, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, next time I'll have uh, also an answer from here. But at the moment, cautious, just because we know um, in some of these theories, um, there can be a huge effect on the size. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you again for your nice presentation. Well, if you, have you. Work with, you can contact directly with the lecture. Thank you, Yuta.